A few of, the, of those drawing cards that Sander has in his deck list. This is the first time we're seeing Clefty on the stream, Ross. Yeah, absolutely. Radiant Greninja being turned off there as well. It turns yep. off the abilities of basic Pokemon, so they're all gone. We do actually see, funnily enough, Sander is playing a 2-2 Curlia line, you yep. know, just desperately trying to get that draw, because, of course, Curlia does have that drawing ability as well. But, yeah, certainly the first turn or two with no Rotom, no Radiant Greninja, that could be really, really big. So Brian wants to get that Clefki out nice and early. It's a card a lot of people have talked about in the run-up to this event, but it's not a card which we've really seen very much of. Now, here come the prizes. Double Penny? Are we worried? Uh, yeah, I mean, he plays three copies, so it's certainly one of those cards. I think Sander always has that rule that if he wants to play a card, even though he has access to his prizes with Peonia, he'll play two if it's important, three if it's essential, which means Penny is essential <laughs> for his deck list. That's not a normal in his active, that's actually the ditto, um, of course, that can use all sorts of Pokemon in the discard pile's attacks with its ability. That's currently being shut down, though, because Brian has led out with that Klefki. Yeah, the perfect start in this particular matchup. And, you know, Brian, like us, if you're playing against Sander, you probably don't know exactly what his deck does, but Brian knows it's going to be some weird kind of control thing. Everybody knows Sander's going to be playing some kind of control thing. So being able to have that Klefki down turn one is huge. Rotom V is not doing anything at the moment. Of course, it's got that amazing ability, lets you draw three cards and it ends your turn. Mm. But Sander's rarely attacking anyway, so it really doesn't matter. It's just yep. an ability that draws three when yep. it's not being turned off. We saw this before with Zacian. It was another great card in many control decks of old. And even without the ability here, Sander might be using this V Pokemon so he can use Forest Seal Stone. He's got a really interesting package going on in his deck list. He's got Stormy Mountains, so he can get this Rotom into play, as well as Regieleki in his deck. And he also plays his Forest Seal Stone to cherry pick some pieces along the way. Absolutely. So Brian here does get that turn one battle VIP pass. This is a really good start from Brian. Having that Klefki turn one active so that Sander couldn't draw cards was amazing. Yep. Having that turn one battle VIP pass is great. And here it, it's just kind of a bit of a race to set up. Can I get going to, you know, start taking these prizes? Because that's what you're going to need to do. But don't play extraneous Pokemon. Don't fill your bench with things you don't actually need. Because that is the kind of thing Sander will take advantage of. So by all means, get a couple of Gardevoir rolling that can be attacking. But you don't want to be playing all these extra Pokemon that Sander can then, you know, gust into the active and then just wear you down as, as his decks tend to do. If you're playing against these control decks, a lot of the time, efficient and streamlined is the key. That's spot on. And Brian does play a copy of Hatterene V. That's a way that he could use a hit and run style approach, making sure he's <laughs> damaging some Pokemon, but still keeping Klefki in the active position. So that could be a card that he goes for later down the line. But for now, he's putting some pressure on with some Klefki action <laughs> with a joust. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 10 damage. <laughs> Would be able to get rid of any Pokemon tools. Were there any there? It's, um, Klefki is not exactly an amazing attacker, but it's doing exactly what it needs to do here. And it looks like Sander starting off with a level ball. And presumably this is going to be going for a Curlia, evolve that route. Yep. And then, of course, you've got access to some draw power. Yeah, you would definitely think that's got to be on Sander's mind here with this level ball. Does still have that Forest Seal Stone, which is not shut off by Klefki because uh, it's just on the tool itself rather than on the V ability. Uh, looks like we're going to see a Rolt here potentially as well. It really depends on what Sander wants to use with his Forest Seal Stone. He plays, as always, in the pretty unconventional supporter <laughs> count. I think some of his biggest dig into the deck is the likes of Chorus's Experiment, of which he plays one copy. <laughs> <laughs> pretty standard. And then there's two copies of... Um, I know, I'm looking at the wrong deck list here, but there's all kinds of stuff here. We've got Silene and Ace Rollers, Premonition, Flannery, you know, that staple certainly that everybody plays. Yeah, these are certainly some cards. Oh, now it is the tech of the day. It is that Morile card, which, of course, has been very trendy. We talked about this on the stream already. It's got that attack that basically stops your opponent retreating. So now the question is, all right, let's go and have a look at Brian's deck list. Does he play any way around? this, I'm not entirely sure that he does. Well, that means this Klefki is going to be doing a lot of jousting. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <go> <laughs> but I think Sander might just be using this to buy as many, t as many turns as possible. You can still draw through your deck with Curliers, and you're just going to use Tempting Trap for as long as you can, so that you're cycling via Curlia, not really under too much pressure from Brian. So I really like seeing that identified early from Sander as the second Rolts is now coming into play after the refinement from Curlia. 
This is part of the reason why the Gardevoir deck is actually so strong. Both these players are using refinement in their list. Sandra is debating whether or not there's any other actions to go for here. Hasn't played a supporter, but is still holding off on that um, Forest Seal Stone activation. Just leaving that Mew in the active position. As we pass back over to Brian. Absolutely, and this is why Brian would not want to be benching something like a Radiant Greninja because that would be absolute just fodder for that Morile to go after with none of that switching. So, you know, you've got your Klefki, which admittedly can joust, but, you know, you can at least get something done there, but it's turning off your opponent's abilities while it's there. Every other Pokemon needs to either be your Hatterene that can hit and run, so it doesn't matter if it can't retreat, or something that can actually be attacking so that there's nothing there that can really be trapped by that Mora. But now the Mora out, Brian at least knows this, and we see all oh, candy into Gardevoir. Turns out Red Candy is good in Gardevoir decks, <laughs> and we get that Gardevoir out with that really great ability. Lets you it basically lets you draw two, but if any of them are psychic energy, you can attach them to your Pokemon in any way you like, which is quite reminiscent of the old Zacian, but it doesn't end your turn. Yeah, really, really helpful, and it allows you to sometimes reach even better numbers with its own brainwave attack. It can allow you, with extra turn attachments and even just hitting from Shining Arcana, it then allows you to reach into uh, V-Star Pokemon quite easily. So that's very relevant to be able to <laughs> get the Arcana hits. But for now, Brian, just simply using it for draw and is once again gonna joust this ditto. Yeah, I like that. You've not got enough energy on the board to start getting any attacks off, so just joust and leave that Klefki in the active. Really turn off anything your opponent might be wanting to do. So, like this play from Brian here, it's quite a slow start, but sometimes against these control decks, you have to have a bit of a slower start because you have to make sure you're not overextending and opening up any lines that Sand is going to take advantage of. Uh, just quickly, you mentioned the Forest Seal Stone there. It's a weird ruling that we see with the Klefki, yeah. but essentially, Rotom doesn't have the ability. Yep. It is an ability that Rotom is able to use. So even when Klefki is stopping the abilities of Pokemon V, it doesn't stop the ability because the ability is on the tool, not on Rotom. We saw yep. it initially with Genesect, yep. and it, it's a ruling that can take a little bit of, you know, bending your mind to kind of really <laughs> get. But it is an ability that a V can use under a lock like Klefki, or a basic Pokemon can use under a yep. thing like Klefki. Similar to Path of the Peak. Exactly. Genesect, like you said, that's the same interaction here. Uh, but Sander still just thinking that he has the time to chill. And it is going to be that Ursaluna V hitting <laughs> the discard Love pile it. with refinement. Essentially, it's just a chunky two prize Pokemon. Yeah. That's the main function of the Ursaluna. And because we're up against a Gardevoir deck that has a very high damage output, I don't think it's going to be the go-to yeah. option in this case. It's really nice for blocking. It's got 230 HP, a weakness that almost nobody's hitting in grass, yeah. and it takes 30 less damage from attacks. It's a really good damage sponge, but in this matchup, it, you can easily get over it with Gardevoir, like you say, so we wouldn't use that. I love Ursaluna V. It, it's one of these weird cards that just does not see play, but... I'd love to see it coming out and doing some damage, maybe later, but now we see the Forest Seal Stone. Right, put you on the spot, Joe. What's he going for? I'd like to see a supporter. Uh, I think the <laughs> Penny makes sense. It could then allow him, as he's drawn into an energy, to go straight into the Tempting Trap and just keep this Clef Key in the active position for as long as possible. Even if your Morwell is getting chipped down by 10 damage a turn, that gives you so much time to use Refinement and get right <laughs> to the bottom of your deck. Sander once again has the Yell Cheer, Silene Palpad loop. That's the way he prevents himself from deck out. So his goal is still to get to the bottom of the deck and trying to loop certain combos. Yeah, absolutely. You don't deck out, so you go down to the minimum number of cards, just the absolute minimum you need in order to get that loop working, and then you just wait for your opponent to deck out while, like you say, it's basically impossible that you do. We do see the penny coming down. You nailed it on that one, Joe. We see the energy on the morale. Up the morale comes, and now that Klefki is stuck in the active. It's not able to retreat. And what's really important here, and please, please stop me if I've missed anything, I am not seeing anything in Brian's deck list that can get around a morale. There's no switch, there's no escape rope, there's no penny, there's none of these cards that we would usually use as an out here. So essentially, Brian has to just set up his guard of war and just kind of wait for Sander to release the clef key. Yeah, we're jousting, boys. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting involved with this clef key. It's not the primary function, but Sander's forcing uh, it to go down this way. And for Brian, it's about patience. It's one of those things where you're giving your opponent so much time. That's always so troubling for control players. When they're able to access all the cards in the deck, it's hugely worrying for you. 
the good news for Brian is he plays three copies of Judge and Palpad. So I feel like once a lock is going to be broken, that's when he's going to try and pounce with some hand disruption and really turn the gears. Yeah, that is absolutely what he could be aiming for for now. We're just nine turns away from Klefki taking out the more thrilling, thrilling nine turns ahead. <laughs> Both cool. players will be drawing a ton of cards, though, so there is going to be action happening here. Oh, there's going to be plenty of stuff going on, but the damage output, I think, is going to be fairly low for, for a couple of turns. And obviously, you know, Sanders still doesn't have access to that Rotom. Of course, now he doesn't want it because he wants to be attacking with the more Isle. Yep. So the Rotom, unfortunately, it got to use a Forest Seal Stone, but it, it never really got to fly on its own and do its thing. It's, it's a little bit sad, but sometimes this happens. So now it seems like we're eyeing up a Chorus's experiment. This is the, um, <laughs> the really aggressive supporter Sander plays, looking at a full five cards from the top of his deck. And of course, because of the nature of this kind of deck, you do end up with a lot of cards that are for a particular matchup. So there's quite a lot of cards. Sander doesn't mind loss zoning in any particular matchup because, oh no, no, that's for something else. We're good. Yeah, I feel like there's a critical mass of Chorus that he's allowed to play in his deck. And I feel like in this case, it's one. <laughs> Otherwise, he would play more, right? Because oh, yeah. uh, in this case, he's had a pretty awkward choice. He had to get rid of um, a key piece there in order to keep some Pal Pads and Peonia, I think he was keeping in the hand, but it's one of those things where, sure, you have a lot of throwaway cards, but if they just come up in the wrong order, in the wrong sequence, you still need to keep a lot available to you, and you already have refinement to get rid of a lot of the other sort of less useful cards in the matchup, so it feels like one is exactly the amount <laughs> that Sander <laughs> wants to have access to. Yeah, I'll go along with you on that one, and then, of course, we just see the more I'll going, yeah, you're you're still stuck, unfortunately. Just, you know, announcing tempting trap. Uh, it does actually mean that the defending Pokemon takes 90, ne uh, 90 extra damage the following turn. That is not what Morale's used for. It is no. just there to, to trap in the active, and that's about it. I mean, I do love the idea that, you know, an attack that does 10 could now KO the Klefki next turn. That would be amusing. <laughs> it's not what we're going for here. We are trapping Klefki in the active and basically saying, look, I need a bit of time to go through enough cards in my deck to set up this loop with Silene and Team Meow's cheer, you know, recovering anything I want every turn. And Moral is just giving me this time to do so. Yeah, Joust is no threat for Sander at all, right? This Klefki's here. We know there's Penny's galore. <laughs> we know there's <laughs> Palpad's galore. We're going to be trapping the whole game away. Uh, he's got a sort of navigates just the judges and the pal pad that Brian has, but this is the game. This is exactly what's happening. This Klefki <laughs> ain't moving. That's that's what's happening right now. So we're we gonna, do... Sorry. Yeah, crack on. We're going to just penny up this more well when it gets just in range of a KO, put it back down, start trapping all over again, as we are seeing a Peonia, by the way, from Sander here, accessing, I think, some of those pennies is yeah. the most important card for him now. Unless you put free cards... Well, you, you, you pick up the free prize cards from your from your prize into your hand, and then you need to essentially replace the ones you picked up. So it doesn't yep. let you look at your entire prizes, but it lets you look at half of them and basically decide if you'd rather have them than the cards that are currently in your hand. And obviously, you know, in a deck like Sanders where you're not taking prizes, something like Peonia, which allows you to access your prizes, becomes so much bigger. We are going to see lots of drawing from Brian. I'm really not too sure why he's cycling through cards in the deck to be honest, because I don't think there's much he can do in terms of pressure. It's just going to continually be this attack, <laughs> this joust, <laughs> uh, because Brian's not even been doing turn. This is the first time he's turn attached since, like, turn one. Yeah. So I think he's just sort of figuring out more of what's going on in Sander's deck. That's also the sort of reconnaissance mission we have to go through whenever we come up against the Sander deck <laughs> to see <laughs> when he gets in his lock, how he gets established, and how you can go about beating him in a second game. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, time comes into it because, yep. yeah, sure, it's always fun to be like, hey, well, you know, that game was fun. I think I figured out how to beat him. Oh, what, there's 10 minutes left? <laughs> that is not <laughs> enough time to actually pull this off. It's, it's one of the huge advantages Sander has playing these kind of cards in his deck because he basically gets to go, look, by the time you figure out how to beat me, you don't have time to beat me. Of course, Sander is sitting here like Brian at five game, five wins, zero losses, zero ties. And with a deck like this, the reason you don't tie very much is because you win a long, slow game one. And even if your opponent has figured out, you know, what to do, there's just, there's no time to win game two, let alone game three. Have we finally seen a judge now for Brian? It's on top of his hand. I feel like this is the only thing you can really weave in. It really comes down to 
when do you want to weave it in, right? Because I feel like you want to do it, maybe not when Morwell's at eight damage, maybe when it's only at seven, because it's too obvious, it's too telegraphed, <laughs> and Sander <laughs> will probably just be reserved and um, Penny when he has to, Yeah, if that makes sense. But also, you can't really judge now knowing that Sander can just you know, use refinement of like five more turns <laughs> under no pressure. <laughs> as we're seeing a Silene getting back Team Yelchir. It's no surprise Silene's going to be getting back the yells or the pal pads. That's kind of how this works. And Santa just putting himself in a really good position to trap away even further here. Yeah, Silene lets you flip two coins for each head. You get to grab a card from your discard pile and put it on top of your deck. And of course, that gets back Team Yow's Cheer. And Team Yow's Cheer lets you shuffle free in any combination of Pokemon and supporter cards other than Team Yow's Cheer from your discard pile into your deck. So Team Yow's Cheer gets Silene, and Silene gets Team Yow's Cheer. And that basically gives you access to anything you want in your deck over and over and over again. Plus, you've got Pow Pad, of course, which can be recovered with Silene as well. And it basically gives you infinite resources. You know, you're playing two Crushing Hammer but you can actually play a lot more than two crushing hammers as you go through the game, if that's where you really want to go with it. We finally see a judge from Brian. This is one of the only things he can do to try and put the pressure on. Um, but again, there's only 10 damage coming down this turn from a joust. <laughs> so Sander has a number of turns to recover from this. He's already put that second penny uh, back into the deck and he's actually drawn straight into it. So I feel like he's already back in a good position and doesn't have to worry too much about anything. He just needs to draw back into an energy, which he top decks. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's looking pretty good, honestly. Oh, of course, Penny can just be picking up that Moral and resetting it if you so wish. Yeah. So it might not be a nine hit KO on Moral. It could be, um, it it's could be a lot more. <laughs> I, feel, I, I honestly feel, I'm sat here right now thinking, Brian started Klefki. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> but we were so happy when he started Klefki, Joe. It looked so good. Honestly, I felt this was a be one of the better ways that you could try and slow down Sander, just because it seemed like Rotom was so important and Radiant Greninja was so important to him setting up. But Sander got more well into the active early enough that then, oh, all the tempo that Brian could put on is just completely evaporating as uh, you're just taking 10 damage a turn. And that's so much time for Sander to sort himself out. Yeah, absolutely. And you might be seeing the energy going on Rotom and going, oh, is he going to attack with Rotom? He is not. Uh, <laughs> it is two lightning energy, 40 damage. You get to put any number of tool cards from your discard pile into the Lost Zone, doing 40 more for each one. That is so far away from being useful in this. No part of that works whatsoever in, in this yep. matchup or in any matchup for Sander. So, you know, that energy is really just kind of retreat fodder and things of that nature, That's I'm afraid. Precisely right, yeah. <laughs> you penny into the Rotom, you pay retreat one, and you attach to the Mawa. That's the game plan. <laughs> That's why Rotom's getting powered up here. Sander is going to do the safe penny at seven damage counters so he doesn't get wrecked by a judge. I like that. And there we go. We see a concession from Brian. He knows what's up, <laughs> and uh, he knows that he wants to get into a new game. Brian's like, you know what? I was down with a nine hit KO on that Moral. I was uh, prepared for that. It was so close. <laughs> <laughs> like I'd hit it seven times, but you know, knowing that now it, it's not two more hits, it's at, at least nine. And let's face it, probably more than nine. And that was, that was very well played from Sander. And the thing is, if you look at that game, Brian played well. Brian did not put down things like the Radiant Greninja, which would be a phenomenal target for, for that um, for that morale. He did not fill his bench of extraneous Pokemon. It was a nice, succinct, I'm going to have a couple of Gardevoir, because that's what I need. I'm going to have my Klefki turning off your abilities, which was a good idea. And I think Brian's basically gone, right, I I've seen enough here. Don't start Klefki. That yep. was a bad idea. And <laughs> maybe... Well, he had to. He had no other choice. Well, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you just get a couple of Gardevoir out and you just try and hit with Gardevoir and hope Sander doesn't make it too awkward. Yeah, and I'm intently looking at Brian's opening hand here because it could all just go awry. If he has to start with a Klefki or a Radiant Greninja, it all goes wrong. If he starts with his uh, Ralts or his Hatterene or even the Zacian, it's a little bit dicey. It's a little bit awkward at times because Sander has looping strategies that he can try and formulate, but it becomes a lot more difficult than just, I'm just going to tempting trap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, if anybody was wondering, yeah, why is Moral so trendy this weekend? That. Yeah. That is why Moral is so trendy. And that wasn't even the best use of Moral, honestly. Yeah. It was just, you know, because you can use Penny to reset it and you can use Infinite Penny. It, 
it just works absolutely beautifully. We see a second mulligan here from Brian. Not it, it's not ideal you're giving extra cards to Sander, but really the mulligan isn't what's important. It is the opening Pokemon here that's going to be absolutely huge. There is, there is a game plan here where Brian can just get a fast start, get some attackers rolling and go from there and maybe rush to six prizes. It's, it's not a great plan because if it was a great plan, that's what everyone would be doing against Sander and Sander mm -hmm. wouldn't be 5-0. and oh. However, it is a plan. And, you know, we, we've not seen many Gardevoir at 5-0. Oh. Brian has a Ooh, very the good Gardevoir list. You that's love to good. see it. <laughs> we okay. get to play the game. Yay! <laughs> this is going to be a completely different game now, I feel. Yeah. Oh, and the Moral's actually in the prizes, and it is only a one-off. Now, obviously, we, we've got that Peonia, which can get it out, which is a... Um, just double checking. Yeah, it definitely yep. is a one-off. So we've got Peonia and we've got a Sui and Heavy Ball. There are ways to get it back, but it's in the prizes for now. Oh, and Brian just attaches and passes. Yep. Uh, he doesn't want any other Pokemon into play. <laughs> no mucking about. <laughs> That's a problem. So let's get rid of those. Oh, Crushing Hammer Tails. Yeah, not. I mean, it's not a huge it's uh, not. deal. I think uh, Sander's trying to get this out of his hand more than anything else because he knows that Brian could be judging. It's actually just a pass here. There's a world <laughs> where everything goes crazy and Brian gets a knockout this turn. But I don't think it's this world. No, I was going to say, we see the Curly are there. It's Mirage Step, yep. Yeah. He's yeah. actually drawn into a couple of his Curlias. This, uh, this Mirage Step might only be able to get one Curlia. He's drawn so many of his refinements. <laughs> of course, that, that, that Mirage Step, that's an interesting one, of course. You know, we, um, we remember it from the frogs back in the day. Yeah, the Frogadier. Yeah, that's the one. Um, but it's kind of, it was in Chilling Rain and nobody really played it because we didn't have a good enough Gardevoir. But now we do have a good enough Gardevoir and it can get your stage ones without having to go for your basics, which is lovely. But of course, like you say, we've drawn into, a, you know, one of a Curlia. There aren't a huge, you know, there's a maximum two here. But I think this is it for Brian. It is get your Gardevoir. And the thing is, Gardevoir EX can accelerate energy yep. to do almost, and you've got to take damage when you do so, so it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but you can almost kind of ignore the crushing hammer because the energy can just come back. But it looks like we've gone for, we've benched the rolls, we've used Mirage Step for a single Curlier yeah. here, and it seems like Brian is setting out his stall, this is what I want to do. Yeah, in any other situation, this would be the saddest Mirage Step <laughs> ever. <laughs> but fortunately, Sander gives you time. That's one thing he will give you. Uh, so it seems good enough for Brian right now. He has to just go Gardevoir Roots. There's no other play for him. We're going to see the Ursa Luna so that he can attach a Forest Seal Stone here. It's a pretty chunky V Pokemon. And Sander can penny this up at different points if it's not targeted quickly enough by Brian. So he is going to get the quick activation with that Forest Seal Stone. Got to feel like he's going for a draw supporter here. Yeah, it's something to get rolling. And you're right, that, that, that is going to be a penny target later on because Brian's thinking, look, if I get enough Psychic Energy on the board, that is an easy two prizes. And when you're going against a deck like Sanders, every prize is just absolutely vital. You need every prize you can get. So I, I do kind of, yeah, I, I like Brian being able to target this down. I like Sander using it as a penny target. But for the time being, you know, any card in your deck is available. Looks like the mountain is the play. So I was going to say, mountain yeah. out the Rotom V, and then also possibly double dip that value and get uh, your Regieleki's out as well. He plays the Sonar Regieleki. Yep. So that can be a card that can recover certain pieces when required. So this seems to be a decent shout as well. Just try and get cycling through your deck now that there's no Klefki to worry about. Yeah, it's, it's so awkward because, like, on the one hand, Brian isn't playing Klefki, so he's giving Sander access to things like Rotom. But on the other hand, we saw what happened when Brian got Klefki last game, and it was not ideal. So it is that Stormy Mountain. Once during your turn, lets you grab either player, a basic Lightning or Dragon Pokemon. Of course, Brian is not really going to be able to take advantage of that. Sander absolutely <laughs> Sander would is. welcome that. <laughs> He'd be loving it. <laughs> Oh, unfortunately, that is not to be. So it, it's just a bit of extra Pokemon Surge. But being a stadium card, it's every turn Pokemon Surge. Get one this turn, one next turn. So I kind of like this. This works quite nicely. And it does feel like we've got more of a game here. Like Sanders having to kind of work that little bit harder and really just try and annoy his opponent a little bit more as we see a boss's orders to drag a Ralts into the active. Yeah, try and force Brian to maybe... Attach retreat. Ooh, we topped out the candy, and he's got Gardevoir in hand. That's looking pretty solid. Uh, could even... Well, there's also Judge that he's eyeing up as well. Has Serena and Judge both as options. You have to really use your Judges well, but once again, he plays three copies and Palpad. So he has multiple ways of trying to disrupt uh, Sander's flow. So I feel like we've got a real game on, on our hands here. It's down to see how Brian wants to navigate things. 
He's chosen just to evolve his Mirage step curlier into Gardevoir EX right now. But of course, you can always move your Ralts out the way when need be this turn. Absolutely. Uh, it, does, it does seem like the judge is going to be coming down here. Yep, yeah, we see the judge. So he did have an opportunity to rare candy into a guard of wire and then, you know, potentially draw one off the judge and get another one out here. But I do kind of like this because, of course, this gives access to potentially having more curlier to draw more cards for a couple yeah. of turns. Obviously, it was the Mirage step that he went and evolved. So had he gone rare candy, that maxes out a one curlier for the next couple of turns. It may well be that Brian just wants to draw more cards than that. Yeah, I, I think he's just looking for psych energy that he can refinement away here. If he can refinement away an energy and then retreat an energy, he could start attacking with his EX, and that would be massive. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Not happening, though. No, it does not have the part <laughs> at all. We see a level ball, presumably for another Curlier here. Yep. Just to, you know, like I say, having a double Curlier, destroying a bunch of extra cards. This is why you didn't wreck, or why Brian didn't wreck Andy, you know, before the judge. And I kind of like it as keeping your options open because... Brian is not really in a rush this game. It is far more important to set up a good board and then start taking prizes than it is to just rush as fast as you can and kind of fall into the trap. That's actually a very good two cards for Brian because now we can pay retreat and evolve into the next Curlier and finally refinement. So getting into double Ooh, psychic nice. is huge here. He can start attacking with his EX and putting some pressure on. Yeah, of course, that ability, one of the best abilities in the game right now. You can just attach Psychic Energy from the discard to any of your Psychic Pokémon. It's fantastic. The only downside is you've got to put two damage counters for every energy that you do. Yep. So you take four damage, but then you can hit 190 turn after turn. And I kind of like this. And, and there is a world where we, you know, build up another big guard of wire and take a KO on that Ursa Luna next turn or the turn after. So in the situation where there is no trap target for Sander, I think his loop involves Mimic UV. I think that's a big part of his combination at this point, where he will go down in a number of prize cards, and then he'll be trying to loop Mimic UV as well as Penny, so that he can continuously get activations of Dummy Doll, and then he can actually knock out Pokemon. Yeah, it's... um. It's kind of ridiculous. So Mimikyu's got that ridiculous ability where when you play from your hand to your bench, it's basically immune for a turn. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it can drop a whopping three damage counters on your opponent's active for every prize card they've taken for just one energy. So yeah, going down a few prizes and looping Mimikyu with Penny, it's, um, it's not exactly your standard plan, probably <laughs> even in Sander's deck, but that is a possibility. And you know, there's a reason why Sander plays that Mimikyu and you've got to imagine, you know, it's the Mimikyu Penny loop. There's big risks that come with that loop, though, of course, because we know Brian has plenty of judge available to him. And if ever you miss a turn of the Penny loop, you immediately <laughs> basically lose on the spot <laughs> where Dummy Doll <laughs> isn't working for you. So that's something that Sander really has to negotiate here. He needs to get into the Dummy Doll loop as quickly as possible, and that involves drawing a ton of cards with these rolls. Yeah, it, it's not an ideal situation at all. So we do have two rolls on the bench here. And so they're going to potentially be evolving next turn. It looks like we're just drawing with Rotom and yep. then passing back over to Brian. And now, Brian, can he get rid of this Ursa Luna? And I, I, I mean, look, I said I wanted Ursa Luna. We've got Ursa Luna. <laughs> it is very much worth reminding ourselves that V-Guard Energy, as the name might suggest, guards against damage from Pokemon V, so will not reduce damage from Guard of War EX. The good news for Brian is he's got boss's orders. And I see a very vulnerable Rotom over there. And I, I feel also... like that's a pretty good <laughs> choice for him. <laughs> yeah, that Rotom is looking mighty vulnerable there. Of course, it's kind of annoying getting rid of it just to turn off the, there we go, 190 HP, two prize Pokemon, and of course, Gardevoir hits 190, and this takes away Sander's draw as well. So th this is best case scenario for yeah. Brian right now. There's no target to be locked in the active with Morile. You're starting to take some prizes, and again, efficient, clean lines, nothing extraneous whatsoever. It is just, I've got a couple of attackers, I can draw cards, but my drawing card, you know, those curly, if they get stuck in the active, I can evolve and start attacking with them as well. Yep. And that, I think, is absolutely crucial here. We're seeing a nest ball from Sander. He's already got the other Rotom in hand, but it may be something that starts becoming too vulnerable with other two prize Pokemon sitting around the board. And Brian, only three prizes away from winning, don't forget. Uh, looks like we're eyeing up the ditto here. <laughs> 
Oh, that ditto. I love that ditto. Of course, we've got the... Um, it looks like a Numal, but it is a ditto. <laughs> it's the one from Pokemon Go. Let's use the attack of any basic Pokemon that does not have a rule box that is in your discard yeah. pile. So it opens up lots of different options. If you're playing kind of a toolsy deck like Sanders, it is a great option to give you access to multiple different attacks in one go. Yeah, it gives you that play of, you know, now you can discard your Mawile instead with a um, Curlia and still get that activation via the ditto and a few different ways. So it really allows you to be a little bit more versatile as we will begin to see some refining from Sander now, another Nest Ball going to hit the discard pile. Uh, but he hasn't drawn many helpful cards, I don't think, just yet. I feel like he's just hoping that the Ursaluna can sponge for a turn here. It's looking a little bit rough right now, his hand. Yeah, there really isn't a huge amount going on. I mean, the good news is the Ursaluna should be able to sponge for a turn. But then the problem is you're kind of locking yourself into needing to get a penny next turn in order to heal the Ursaluna, lest you give up, you know, prizes number four and five. And it does feel a little bit here like Sanders kind of on the defensive. It's stopping Brian taking prizes rather than really doing what it is that you would usually want to be doing. This loop, this lock is not established as it stands at the moment. We, we do have Rotom and Mimikyu in hand, but it does feel like Brian is playing this, this game absolutely perfectly and you know, setting up this minimalist setup, which it does seem to be working at least for now. Let's see if there's any more actions for Sana. Definitely debating that Rotom. His hand is bad enough that you might just think, well, I've got to take that gamble at this point. I'm getting nowhere near the combination that I need. So let's try this Rotom. Also going to see the turn attachment of double turbo energy. He does play quite the assortment of energy in his deck. There's <laughs> two psychic, one water, four double turbo, and a V guard. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. <laughs> it is a weird energy line, but then again, he's also playing Ursaluna V and a single ditto, Puka Muku. The, these cars that we don't generally, you know, one Shadow Rider Calyrex V, because obviously there's, yep. there's going to be one of those. No, not the VMAX, just the V. The V will do fine. Yep. So it is, it is one of those decks where you look at it, and I think if you're not Sanders, you know, people aren't just going to be randomly net decking Sanders' list and just playing it, you know, all over. This is a list where you need to know it inside and out. But we do see a pass over to Brian here. I mean, I would love to see a KO with the single prize Gardevoir here, but I think you need to stretch and get so much energy on there. It, it's not really realistic. It's probably just going to be more along the lines of see whatever, you know, use refinement if you wish, get a couple of cards, but outside of that, it's just going to be a, well, a hit with Gardevoir, but I love this, playing down the Sky Seal Stone at the same time as playing a judge and basically kind of telegraphing, hey, I want to get a KO with this, but also, oh, it's not going to work because it's only against a V-Star or a V-Max. Yeah, <laughs> just, just finishing want to draw it. Yeah. <laughs> just finishing your hand. Sorry, <laughs> fine, just finishing your hand. So I think there's only one Psychic currently in the discard pile for yes. Brian. The retreat would give him two more to play with. So if he can judge once again into some Psychic Energy and refine enough away, he could get close to dealing with this Ursa Luna. It's 260. You don't worry about the V-Guard if you're just using a single prize Pokemon, and Brainwave can easily get there. It can indeed. So I believe it's seven energy you would need on Gardevoir. That would put you at 270, minus the 30 for the ability is 240, which is 10 more than you need. So yep. I believe it is seven energy you need on the Gardevoir. Ooh, here we go. And we have drawn into Shining Arcana. Okay, so that would... turn attachment as well. It's looking pretty tempting. I'm not sure if there's enough psychic energy in the discard pile for Brian to make the play, though. No. He may just have to go for a 190 damage hit here. You can get two more in the discard by retreating your active yeah. guard of Wari X, but that's only three. You need five. So unless we can see two more Psych Energy hit in the discard, I think, unfortunately, that is the only option here. It yeah. would be a lovely play to bring out the, the single prize and get this giant KO, but nah, just settling for doing 160 here. Let's see. Well, there's already a penny in, in hand, so <laughs> finding this Ursa Luna can make its way out of play, which I think is pretty big for Sander, actually. Oh, yeah. How else can he go about his turn? He's got a number of trekking shoes that he might want to use before his refinement as well. These are all options for Sander. You can see, taking his time, difficult decisions all around. He's leaking prizes. <laughs> he needs to find a way of slowing this down. Brian still has so many resources left. He's been judged twice. There's only been one boss's orders. We know there's a power pad as well, so Brian has 
a fairly easy route, I'm saying that cautiously, <laughs> to taking his last three prize cards. I mean, it's all kind of relative. Compared to most people when they're playing against Sander would look at Brian's setup here and be like, oh, you know, I want that. That yeah. is what I want. This, this, is, this, this feels good. It's not like it is in some other matchups, but the fact of the matter is there's no obvious lot going on at the moment. There's no obvious target for something like a morale. You've got attackers ready to go. You've got drawing options on the board. You're down to three prizes remaining. It's, it's basically, th th this is the best case scenario for Brian here. But we did see back in game one, if you start Klefki or you start raiding Greninja, you probably lose the game right there and then. So game two looks like Brian might be able to close it out, but we're still in the same situation where game three could be just that straightforward. If you started the wrong Pokemon, now you can't win. I mean, Ace is premonition. I, how does Sander come to the conclusion that this is the perfect card for his deck? I mean, it's incredible <laughs> seeing these cards in his deck, and he's on such phenomenal records all the time. Acerola's Premonition, my goodness. When I pulled that card, it was straight in the bulk box for me. But yeah. Sander out here rocking it. Wow, you look at your opponent's hand, draw a card for each trainer you find there. Of course, it's not just the drawing that you get from Ace Roller's Premonition, it's also the information. You get to look at your sure. opponent's hand, and, you know, if you're a player as good as Sander, who's been playing for as long as he has, you will be able to look at that and go, OK, I, I know what your options are for next turn. So yep. the information's good, but it doesn't seem like Sander's really gotten very close to any kind of a lock in this game. No. The Ursa Luna sitting in the active, sponging, and everything else. You know, you've got Rotom for draw, Greninja for draw, Curlia for draw, Curlia for draw, and Ditto, which isn't really doing much of anything right now. So it does make me wonder, like, what, what is Sander's plan in this game? We saw yeah. in, in game one, but in game two, I'm not seeing much of a lot coming on here. Yeah, just goes for a Rotom to end his turn. So this Ursa Luna could be going down, and this Power oh, no. Pad spells trouble for Sander. Oh, this is bad. We know the boss's orders is going to be going straight back in. Yeah. You KO the, uh, the Ursa Luna, and honestly, down to one prize remaining, you might not even need the boss's orders at that stage, but it's still nice to kind of have it there as a little bit of an option if there's a particular Pokemon that's easier to take out. But it certainly does look like, and this is kind of what we were saying. Game one was Brian going, oh, that that's how I win. <laughs> and then game two is Brian going, okay, let's actually try and put this into um, put this into practice here. We are seeing a few refinements now, but Brian's got to be feeling good about this. Yeah. He's going to guarantee two prizes this term without need of anything else. And then it's down how he can construct that last prize. And it's almost always coming from that boss's orders with so many vulnerable single prizes on Sander's board. It really doesn't matter. He's not too worried about these dummy doll shenanigans that a Mimikyu could put up. No, because if there's only one prize remaining and you've got your boss's orders in deck, sooner or later you will draw into it. And I kind of, I love the patience of Brian in this game, Leave, getting those two curlier. And, you know, we, we saw with the, you know, not using rare candy earlier on, making sure that you've got those two curlier and they can evolve if you need them to, but really saying, I will only evolve these curlier if I absolutely have to, because the best use they can be for me right now is drawing a bunch of extra cards. We see the KO on the Ursa Luna. Brian goes down to one prize remaining. And with a boss's orders in the deck, Sander's got to be thinking, you know what, this isn't going great. But also, Sander's deck is not built to win a quick game <laughs> three. No, absolutely not. We are seeing the Penny into the Dummy Doll Mimikyu. We're going to see some jealous eyes here. But I think Sander knows that all he can do is uh, hope that Brian doesn't get into his boss's orders in time. And that literally is it. We don't have it at the moment, but there are some... Um, oh, no, that's the wrong hand. That's Sander's hand. <laughs> he, that's not really relevant if he's got boss's orders. But there's Brian. Um, if he had it, you think he'd play it by now. Yep. It is, you know, you've got a couple of refinements to use. There is no Luminion or anything in his deck that will no. be able to get it off of an Ultra Ball, for instance. So I think you do have to just draw it here. But you don't need it this time. You can give up a few prizes if you're Brian. You have to be a little bit careful because Mimikyu does a, a decent chunk of damage. Oh, if yes. you're not getting there in time, you're a little bit in trouble. You, you don't have infinite turns, but you have, a, you know, you got two or three turns. You can let Sander take a couple of prizes because, you know, the Mimikyu is now invulnerable. But if Sander misses a turn of Penny, you win. If you hit the boss's <laughs> orders, you win. Uh, there's no escape rope or anything like that because, as we've said, you know, these Gardevoir decks, they just don't have room for the switching. Right. That's why the morale works so well against them. But it does look like Brian's got 
a bunch of options in terms of drawing. That guard of wire, of course, draws two cards, but it doesn't look like he's got it at the moment. So, I think, he's, debat I think he's debating a Clara just for a Shining Arcana. He could go for it next turn, so it would give himself refinement plus Arcana plus Arcana. If yeah, he Clara now. He's also, I believe, got Avery, which could just be a raw draw three. Also looking pretty good. The Ditto is an easy discard here. Yeah. Brian's got a huge hand size, I don't think and he's we got know it. that the Sander is locked into Penny. He cannot hand disrupt. He doesn't play any hand disruption supporters. He is locked into that Penny here. Yep. Got to have the Penny, or else you don't pick up the Mimikyu. And if you don't pick up the Mimikyu, the whole blocking thing falls apart. Yep. Now there is a Penny in hand, so that's easy. Sander's definitely got it for this turn. But how many turns can he realistically Penny for? I mean, he's dodging he, and weaving right now. He is dodging and weaving because you know cards like Silene and Team Yao's Tear get Penny back but they are themselves supporters, so if you use them, you can't use Penny. That's why you play three pal pad, right? You, try, oh, you just reload yeah. with pads. That's the plan, at least, because essentially, Brian's not allowed to put down many more Pokemon at all in this <laughs> game. He can maybe Clara back like a Ralts or something once this God of White EX goes down. Uh, if you don't hit boss's orders, obviously, that would be the only thing you can go for. Yeah. But it, feel, it does, for me, feel like Brian's still in the commanding position here because he has so few cards remaining in this deck. Yeah, and he's going to see four. He's going to see five of those cards. One draw for turn, two off the Curlier, two off the Gardevoir. Yeah. So we are going to see five of them. So, I mean, you know, there, there is always an emergency play of benching Radiant Greninja, but you have to do that to kind of get it at the last minute. That's because if you don't hit it off the yeah. Radiant Greninja, it then you lose. Two cards, right? Yeah. Yeah, but if, but you know, if we get down to say two cards, or you're going to lose next turn, there is an emergency play with Greninja, but but that is a break glass in case of emergency kind of play. <laughs> Sander just making, for, making sure he's getting rid of as many cards as possible, just in case he is judged if uh, he does once again manage to uh, dodge the boss's orders. I feel like Brian might feel like a judge is a decent shout uh, because you're also able to win if you just stop, uh, stop the dummy doll, obviously. Oh, yes. uh, so Sander is just getting rid of as many cards as possible to judge-proof himself here, including benching this mill tank. Yeah, and uh, will actually take some prize cards. <laughs> hey, he's had to take that. prizes. Yeah. Oh, so where are we here? It's uh, to the top deck is a battle VIP pass. Oh, and we've got a level ball, so potentially we can thin the deck a little bit here. Let's see how many cards we're working with here. Oh, too many. Eyeballing it, it's looking like probably more than ten, maybe eleven or twelve cards or so. We're only seeing four this turn, and if this guard of ours dealt with, then you don't have any X that you could go into. Ooh, no hit off the Arcana. We still have the refinement. Is it boss's Missing orders? Again. It's not. Brian probably has to Clara now this turn and just reestablish some rolls. Yeah, you need to get some rolls down because you need an attacker. For That's the thing. You, you need an attacker that's ready to go. And it is worth pointing out with the EX having hit the discard pile, you will need to get some energy on Guard of War. It's, it's not as easy as it was when the EX was, was on the board. You need free energy on that Guard of War to attack with Brainwave. And yes, it's got the ability that can get the energy, but it's not guaranteed to get the energy. So sure. th this is getting a little bit awkward. And actually, I want, yeah, I wonder if Brian's going to be patient and go for a Clara play, or if he's just going to go for the Judge now. He's just seen Sander play a number of cards, which makes his Judge less appealing. But it's actually going to be a attach retreat play into the Rolts here. So he doesn't want uh, Sander knocking out his Shining Arcana. This makes a ton of sense. Yeah. It just it makes sure that he has as much draw as possible for next turn. I like this. Giving up the prize doesn't really matter. It is a race to get your boss's orders. If you yeah. hit it, you win. If you don't, or if Sander you know, misses the loop. But here it's like, you know what? Have a prize. I don't care. You taking a prize doesn't really do much for you. Yeah. Now we do see another Mimikyu coming down here as well. Yep. So we've at least got Mimikyu this turn and next turn. Yeah, but it's really still the story of Brian here. Oh, yeah. Sandra is still many prizes away. <laughs> so he will once again be immune with this Mimikyu, thanks to the dummy doll. But there it is, there boss's it is. orders. And we know there's the EX in hand for Brian. He's finally got over the line and will be able to brainwave for his final prize card. Yeah, that was beautiful. Having the EX ready to evolve, that gets all the energy back with the boss's orders. And that, that was a clinic from Brian in that game. That was extraordinarily well played. Just basically going, this is how I win the game. And it's a very patient, it took a long time. And, and now we've got to be thinking, this could still end up in a tie. I mean, Sanders' deck, it, it's not built to win in game three. It's built to win no. game one. And then game two doesn't finish. And then you win 1-0. One, one -oh.
And maybe you win 2-0 a couple of games, but it's built to win 1-0. That's what a lot of these control decks generally do. Now we're going into game three with seven and a half minutes left. There is a chance that Brian could potentially rush and win. It's, it's, it's a bit awkward, but it's doable. Yeah. I'm not sure there is a chance Sander can. No, he doesn't have an off switch. He doesn't have a different way to uh, win with this deck at all. Uh, most of his energy can't deal damage. It's literally dummy doll, and that requires your opponent having loads of prize cards. <laughs> uh, so I feel like, yeah, he is pretty locked into um, trying to win via the controlling strategy, which means you have to say that if anyone's going to be winning this game, it's going to be Brian. But even that's low percentages, especially if he starts with a non rolts here. <laughs> that could also be a huge issue for him. And unfortunately, that is one of the weaknesses of Sander's list this time around, that as soon as the opponent knows your tricks, um, the dummy doll is a far less secure win condition, especially because he had to leak so many prizes to get into that lock. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that, that's the thing. If Brian starts with the wrong Pokemon here, then Sander can just be like, more I'll draw. <laughs> it's going to be a tie, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And we can, we can sit here for a while or, or we can just kind of shake hands and have a, have a tie because if Brian had a way out of the more I'll lock, we would have seen it in game one. What yep. we saw was, I think, seven hits on Morrow with Clef Key and then a concession. I respect the joust, though. You've got to do it. Oh, you've got to <laughs> respect the joust. <laughs> but I do think it's a case of if we see the wrong starting Pokemon here and we do see the Morrow lock established, then that kind of puts us into a tie. This is legitimately huge as to, as to which one. <laughs> oh, there's some neat prize cards right there. It's going to be huge as to what Brian's opening uh, prize is here, his, his opening Pokemon. If it's a Klefki or a Radiant Greninja, that is very bad. What have we got? It's a route, so we got a game. We're good. <laughs> and we have a Manaphy in the active position as well. But not uh, that Manaphy. No, not the one you're thinking of. <laughs> this one requires water energy in order to attack. And uh, there's only one water energy in the deck, so I wouldn't expect to be seeing much of it here. But Sander actually had an exceptional start. He only plays two rolls. He has them. And Ooh, he was also nice. able to Rotom uh, to end his turn here. Both players playing at a pretty decent pace. Sanders saying, look, I got set up. You're not going to pull the rug from me. I'm in the game. Um, <laughs> and Brian also has a battle VIP pass, so he's also um, getting rolling pretty nicely here. And this is exactly what we saw from Brian last time. Treble routes don't need anything else. Okay, fine, one was a curly, but you get what I mean. <laughs> Three of that evolution line running around here, so that's exactly what we see. And, yeah, we're just kind of happy to go. Yeah, fair play to both these players really going at a breakneck speed. They both want the three points. There's no doubt about that. And uh, even for Sander, where it could feel disadvantageous to be rushing through every action at this point, you just have to say, yep, I respect it. This is how you're playing the game. It's how you've chosen to build your deck. Uh, let's just see how far you can get with your list. Worth pointing out, the Manaphy does let you look at your opponent's hand and potentially bench two basic Pokemon from there. It's a big part of the deck, actually, yeah. It is pretty, pretty cool. So... If Sander can find his water energy, that's a big... If, oh, and there is a Klefki in Brian's hand. Yep. So there is, there is a potential here for Sander to use Manaphy's attack to go and get that Klefki out of Brian's hand yeah. and then lock it with a Moral. It, it's awkward and it needs that one water energy. We don't have it yet, I don't believe. No. If we find the Forest Seal Stone... Oh, there is Forest Seal Stone. So Ooh. we could actually see it early from Sander. I mean, this, this seems to be... I, it's not going to win Sand of the Round, let's be perfectly clear. There's not enough time for this to win Sand of the Round. What it will do, however, is essentially guarantee a tie. Now, obviously, Sander doesn't know what's in Brian's hand, but Sander knows this matchup way better than we do and is way more experienced here than us and kind of knows at this stage, with Brian set up, my best chance to win is use Manaphy, get something on the bench, and just hope I can lock that in the active. Going to be another refinement curlier, I believe, from the Forest Seal Stone. Uh, Sandra is going to keep churning through the deck. I think the water might actually be in his prize cards, to be honest oh, with you. Oh, that would not be um, good. So we are going to see the Pukamuku from level It one. is in the prizes. I've just, I've just had yep. a sneaky look. That's No, it's not even an option. No, I think he was eyeing it up when he was going for the forest and then just sees, well, let's just get a refinement instead. Oh. Pukamuku definitely is one of those Sander cards. <laughs> he loves getting <laughs> value from this card over and over again. It's actually made some of his loops possible simply by... Um, like rearranging the amount of cards in your deck can be huge, especially because it forces itself guaranteed to the bottom. Yep. It can be a great card for his approach to deck building, so you'll often see it in his 60-card list, as we are seeing that textbook one of Colrus. Yeah, absolutely. Seems to be coming out quite a lot here. 
So, I mean, with Xander not having the Mana Fee as an option, of course, the Sui and Heavy Ball will get a basic Pokemon, but it won't get an energy. The only, we've got Miltank and Eveltal, which are essentially yeah. options in there. Looks like we're going for the Miltank. So, it does seem like this game is basically just going to be, can Brian rush fast enough? And with this many Pokemon out this early, and Brian having to take a, a slower route a lot of the time, not being able to use stuff like Raiding Greninja, etc. cetera, I, I do worry that we are kind of headed to a tie here because I'm not sure either player has got enough time to really bring this home. So, yeah, Brian has to go like the clappers with his level ball. <laughs> He's going to have to do a ton of refining himself. Ideally, he gets into two Curlia and then one Gardevoir with that rare candy play like we saw yeah. in the previous game. Good to see Brian... Uh, Stopping shuffling and trying to give himself as much time as possible here. Getting a Fog Crystal activation as well for Psychic Energy. He's, uh, of course, integral in the Gardevoir deck, so he can utilize them, power them up from the discard pile, pile all in one turn. I think there is already Rare Candy in hand, so this is look like, looking like a pretty good start for Brian. This is not too bad at all. It's now they're all the oh, no. so can't piece together the Rare Candy combo. He's instead just going to try and disrupt Sander, who's done very well. He's already got double Curlia developed <laughs> and Greninja and Rotom. Uh, but I think Brian is also doing this for his own side of things, where he wants to get more Curlia out, if nothing else. Yeah, and I've just tried to look at the maths here. You know, Brian... That's a woeful forecast. <laughs> not what you're looking for. Yeah, and then Brian realistically is going to have maybe, if it comes back, it's probably going to be two turns, let's be honest with yep. you. It's unlikely Brian will get a third turn. If he did get a third turn, he would need to take two prizes three turns in a row in order to turn this tie into a win. Uh, and there's no way Sander is going to put down three Pokemon V or, you know, two prize Pokemon. It's not going to be a thing. So it does seem like we are headed to a tie here unless one of these players can surprise us. But I just think we've run out of time. And it, it, it's got to be frustrating for Brian here. Because you lose game one because you just don't, you know, you start the clef key. Even if you knew what you were doing, you started clef key. Yep. You win game two. And game three, you've got to think if game three carries on, Brian is very much in the driver's seat. And unless Sander can really make use of that Mimikyu lock. But it, you just don't have time to do so because you've lost game one too slowly. It's just going to be a Rotom as Sander continues to churn through the deck. And Brian now has one refinement and now can go into Shining Arcana for a couple more cards, actually pretty big. Gets into the Worker, we can see three more cards now as well. I think they have just yes. been informed of time and we see the fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not play around anymore. Uh, I think you're always relieved when you finish the Sander game, uh, no matter what the result, <laughs> if you've won, lost or drawn against him, because you're just in a different type of think tank the entire time. Uh, so both players immediately acknowledging that this is going to be a tie. And I think when you're up against Sander, especially it's a new format. You've never seen any version of Control before. You're seeing all of these new random cards in his deck list. I think overall, Brian could be fairly happy with that tie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a weird kind of situation, right? Because on the one hand, you can look at that and go, that's a game I should have won. I should have won that game. Mm. But then on the other situation, you're like, well... I didn't win game one. I didn't really know what was going on game one. And, you know, I'm playing against the, the absolute master of control decks, against a deck I did not know what was going on. And I still came out of that and salvaged a tie. And actually, in that regard, that's pretty nice. I kind of like this. Yeah, and they are still on phenomenal records, of course. They have still uh, three rounds to go to just get that one win to get themselves into day two. So feeling pretty good about themselves and feeling like they've both got a really good shot of not only getting into that six win record but also giving yourself a couple chances to get even further and uh, make it easier for you as you go through that day two run as well yeah no absolutely you know both of these players you, you've got to imagine they're both feeling pretty good about their day two chances they're sitting there at 501 so i believe one win for either of them yeah. will put them at 601 so if they then lost their last two rounds they would still be in so they're both absolutely on for day two now the question is can they give themselves a better chance because that's one of the things about day two we need to start kind of talking about this as we get closer to getting people into day two not all day two players are going to be going in equal right it depends on your day one record the records get amalgamated between day one and day two so sure 19 match points will get you in 
but I dread to think how many <laughs> players are going to be in today too. You know, I've, I've seen <laughs> players go 401 and not make it sure. into top eight right. because they literally had to go five and zero. Oh. So if you can get yourself an extra couple of wins, you know there is a gigantic difference between six two one and eight oh one. You know, any player that finishes eight oh one going into day two has got such an easier route into that top eight because the cut from day two down to top eight is a harsh cut. Yeah, and I also think Sander does a lot of his best work in day one as well, because that's when his deck list is basically entirely unknown. Yeah. And then over that night, and especially, unfortunately, now that he's been on stream, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of his cards will start becoming more known. So then when he's in that day two, he has a tougher time of things. People know how to play around. Just because they see it's Sander, they know exactly what he's playing and the list at that stage. So he needs to really accumulate as many points as possible in that first day to give himself that opportunity in day two. Now, even if people know his deck list, sometimes he's still going to get the better of you oh, yeah. with his tech cards. So don't say as soon as his deck list is known, it's not going to win anymore. That's nowhere near the case. No. But uh, it just becomes a lot more difficult for him specifically. And I've talked to him a lot about this, where um, it feels really disadvantageous sometimes for him to be on stream. Unfortunately, that's um, suffering from success.